Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. And we'll stop there and let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you bless us uh, this morning um, as we hear uh, things that uh, pertaining to the word that you've left for us uh, and things that you want us to know, uh, things about you, things about your son, uh, what it all means for us uh, as we live our lives each day, uh, because that is what is important uh, as, we, as we're here. Uh, we have something, uh, and Lord, help us to understand what it is that we do have and what are we supposed to do with it um, so that others might see. Uh, as we have seen. Amen. Amen. All right, so Paul says that we have gifts, and in the NASB it says each of us was given a gift and we're to use it. Uh, it says accordingly. Um, last week we briefly looked at examples uh, gifts as examples of how to conduct ourselves. Um, we talked a little bit about the gifts in here, but I think mostly we, we aimed it at the gift of grace that God has given. Um, the purpose of those gifts, or the purpose of it, is to unify us um, as one, so that when we are living, even though each one is on his, his own separate way, it's under a unified purpose. Um, so that people can see what that purpose is. So it says in the NRSV that we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us. So it's worded a little differently. Um, each translation that I looked at has it a little differently. Jonathan Mitchell says, Now constantly holding, excelling grace effects, down from, in accord with, and to the level of the grace and joyous favor being given to us, in us and for us. So it's a joyous grace that's been given to us. Uh, it's something that's supposed to be, when I think of joy, I think of uplifting, happy, positive, right? Uh, uh, Brother Chuck had a shirt sometimes he wears, positive vibes only. That's what I think of it as, positive. Uh, that is what this grace um, that God has given us, it says he's, he uses joyous favor, or favor could be mercy. Uh, it's been handed down to us. Some people might hold that they have special gifts that others don't have. Um, and obviously, this was probably the case in Rome, since Paul wrote it out as he did. Um, we know in, the, in Ephesians, he also talks about the gifts, but then says, uh, you know, he says elsewhere that these, these gifts might be ceasing. Um, but they're excelling grace effects, according to Jonathan Mitchell. The Passion Translation says, God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. So if God has given you the grace gift... Of prophecy, you must activate your gift by using the proportion of faith you have to prophesy. If your grace gift is serving, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, then be actively teaching and training others. And so I wondered, well, they use grace hyphen gift as though it's one word. So, of course, I want to know, is it really one word? What is this idea? Well, the Net Bible also used grace gifts. It says this word comes from the same root as grace. In the following clause, it means things graciously given or grace gifts. And if you break it apart, as they do, grace is charis and gift is... I didn't write down the word for gift. But put them together, and you have charisma, which is a word that we're familiar with, right? Uh, there's a whole uh, portion of Christianity that we call charismatics. They call themselves charismatics because they believe that they have gifts. It's interesting 
that only Paul uses the word charisma out of the whole New Testament. Jesus never uses it, and neither do uh, the disciples. He starts using it in Romans 5 when he's describing the awesome work that God did for us on the cross through his son. That was a grace gift. That was, according to the New Testament, if you read through it, Paul was the first one to come up with, with the idea, though it's not really a new idea, but he was the first one to verbalize it, that the cross, what Jesus has done, what God has done through Jesus, is a grace gift. And what does Paul say? It results in salvation, justification. We would, might think of salvation, many people would think of salvation as eternal life, which is true. In John 17, 3, it says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So according to Jesus, eternal life, or what Paul calls a grace gift, is simply knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. And this is not to take away from the fact that when we die, we're going to be resurrected, and we are going to live eternally um, in the future times, however, um, whatever they might be like. It is to say that right now we have a gift, and it's a grace gift, and it's the gift of the cross. So knowing God is a, if you want to use Greek, a charisma. The Message Bible, which I always seem to, after I look at different versions and try to see what the, I, I want to see, what, what do they say is a plain, very plain interpretation. It says, so since we have found ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ, let's go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. So I think, as I look at this, the way I see it is we have the grace of God. And I think we all know that, right? But we don't just have the grace of God bottled up inside, right? We say, you could say, I have the grace of God. It's all mine, right? And it is all yours. However, the grace of God doesn't come into your life and just sit there. The grace of God wants to move, wants to come out. It wants to be seen. Uh, and one thing about Mr. Woos and Mr. Mitchell, and I think uh, the, the Passion Translation touched on this, because they said, let me scroll back up, it says you must activate your gift. It's what Jonathan Mitchell would call, or Woost would call, experiential. You have to experience it. It doesn't just come into your life one time, and now you think, I have God's grace. I'm all set. There's more behind it. There's more for it. There's more that God wants out of it. Yes. You have grace every day? Sure. Yep. New, kind of like David says, new mercies in the morning, right? Every morning, new mercy, new grace. Um, some might say, uh, use the, the, the phrase, you know, uh, but by the grace of God, here, here I am, right? So, yeah. It's a, it's a, you have the right idea. It's a daily thing. It's something that we experience. Yep every day so when we say to live with intention that doesn't mean that as we said last week it doesn't mean get up and get on your knees and pray god where do you want me today i think it just means to get up and go with the grace that he's given you and do something like the passion translation says activate it do something with it 
and show it to others because the grace is not meant to stay here. It's meant to, fo to flow out. Um, in Romans 5, uh, Mr. Mitchell uses the, uh, the love that God's pouring into us, that he has poured into us as gushing into us. It's not poured into you and then he waits till it gets to the top and then he stops pouring. It's just pouring. It just keeps going, right? And it's just the gush effect, right? It just keeps coming out and coming out and coming out. Um, it, he doesn't turn it off, and he's never going to turn it off. We are something. Um, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 10, we turn, turn back over there because we're going to read other stuff from Ephesians this morning. In verse 10 of Ephesians 2, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I think we could take these good works and this workmanship that he's given us and almost take it to the same idea that Paul's trying to get to them in Romans 12. And, you know, in, in verse 9, it says it's not... The gift is from God. It's not because of works. It's not that we should boast. It's not that we should boast before, and it's not that we should boast after. We realize that we have this grace. It's from God. But when he says he uses the word workmanship, or his workmanship, when you make something, it has a purpose. And that purpose is that it's going to be used for something, right? Um, you know, you, you have a Bible. It was all put together. It's meant to be read and used. Uh, you know, if you pour a cup of tea, you don't just set it on the counter and let it sit there and get cold, hopefully, unless you're like me and you forget that you made a cup of tea. And then three hours later, you're like, oh, I had tea. It's cold, but I still drink it. You make it for something. Uh, it's a workmanship. It's something that you've created. So it's to be used for good works. And that's what he's saying in chapter 2. Uh, you know, I've always gone back and forth with this. You know, I used to wonder what, what are the good works I'm supposed to do? And then I read it and say, oh, I don't have to worry about the good works because he's the good work. And then I think, well, wait a minute. There's got to be something, right? You got to do something. And you do. You have, to, you have to use what he has made. He's made it. You use it. Um, I think Paul is saying it's a, it's a gift that we've been giving, so we need to use it properly, and we need to use it well, because it's been given by God. We might, I think, part of, uh, part of my problem, and I'm sure part of many problem, people's problem, is we like to make things complex, and we discussed that last week. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Ecclesiastes 7.29, it says, Behold, I have found this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. So uh, I followed that through a commentary in reference to Ephesians 2.10, uh, saying that people make things complex. And the translation they used, I can't remember what it was, I should have written it down for you, but it says uh, basically that we're what God has made us, God made men upright. He made them to be something, but they've sought other things. And this other one said, but they want to make things complex. And when they make things complex, before you know it, they're not upright anymore because they've muddled, they've muddied, uh, muddied the waters. Um, they've taken things and they've, they've made it things that God didn't intend it to be, uh, not just people who aren't believers, but even believers. They've taken the idea of the gifts and the grace, and they've, they've muddied it. So what is so far, I think, to me, and hopefully I've impressed this upon you, what is the big context of Romans chapter 12? We talked about it a lot. It is 
to be a living sacrifice, right? Then we talked about being holy, which is to be set apart as a living sacrifice, having humility. And then last week we talked about unity. So what do we do with grace? As we just said, we live it. It's a fifth, we'll say it's a fifth point. So if we use living sacrifice, holy, humility, unity, and grace, that's to be lived. If someone gives you a vase, and it's a beautiful vase, and you take it and you put it on your counter, and maybe you put flowers in it, uh, maybe you put dried flowers in it, maybe fresh flowers. Some people might put pens and pencils in it. They'll do something with it, right? Because maybe their aunt or someone important to them gave it to them. But then after a number of years, they might say, wow, this vase has been sitting here for a while. And they box it or they put it somewhere and they, they put it away. But what if God gave you the vase? If God right now physically gave you a vase, would you put it away ever? I mean, you know, someone gave my son a Josh Allen jersey in a frame signed. It's really nice. It hangs on a wall. I wonder, is Danny ever going to take that down and put it away? Unless he gets married someday and his wife says, that doesn't belong. That's, that doesn't fit the decor. <laughs> I bet you he'll find somewhere to put that. It's special. It's nice. If God gave you a vase, it's unlikely, hopefully, that you would put it away. But that's what we do. We take the grace that he's given us, and we put it away. And I think we put it away all the time. Uh, but we should be using it every moment, because that's what he gave it to us for. Um, Turn over to, we're in Ephesians, so go to chapter 4. And we're going to read verse 29. Paul says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now, in my Bible, of the moment is italicized, and this is one of those interesting moments where you would start opening all kinds of other Bibles and see what do they say for in the moment. But it says for the need of every moment. Every moment you're in, it's for edification. The word is for edification. No unwholesome words, Paul says. Our word, what comes out of us, should be what is coming out because of God's grace. That should be coming out, and it should be something that brings unity and harmony and something that brings love. That is uh, part of what he's saying here in this passage, is how do we speak? How do we carry ourselves? How do we carry ourselves among other people? We need to remember that we are here for a reason. I think everybody's here for a reason, but the base reason is to help each other. And we do that, when we do that, uh, in the way that God was ha would have us do it, it is a way to show that his grace is coming out. So when Paul is saying of speaking and acting this way, because it's something that we've been given, um, Ephesians 1 says that this is how God thinks of us. He thinks of us as blessed, as children, um, as we could say brothers and sisters of his son. He thinks of us in that way, and he's blessed us in that way. Uh, one thing that came to my mind was, you know, uh, several years ago, there was a whole thing about pay it forward, right? And what a great idea that was. And you saw little things on Facebook and stuff of, you know, someone in McDonald's in the line, uh, they came up to get their order and it was paid for because someone else paid for it. And that idea brought out in people, yeah, we're supposed to be doing things for each other and helping each other. Well, that's what, that's what God's grace is. Um, if we continue reading in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us in offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So we have the idea again of sacrificial. It was a pleasing aroma when God gave himself or Jesus gave himself up. Uh, and God, um, it describes it as God smelled it. Uh, that's what an aroma would be. God saw it. He experienced it and said, wow, this is what it is about. And so the idea Paul's trying to give us here, as we see in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, is to be imitators. And how do we imitate? He says in the next verse, walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up as a sacrifice, just like he's talking about for us to do in Romans chapter 12, a sacrifice, a, a self-sacrifice. That's what Jesus was. I think it's the only thing since, as Ecclesiastes says, he made men to be upright, it's the only thing he truly ever wanted to experience out of men, or smell that aroma of self-sacrifice. Every time somebody does something that's self-sacrificial, I, I might think now, in my mind, there's an aroma. There's an aroma. And then if you have a wild imagination, you could picture people walking around, all of a sudden a puff of smoke comes out of them. You know, God sees it. God experiences it. God is happy. It's what he wants. Up in verse 30, uh, it says that, Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then he goes on to say, how, do, you know, how can you grieve? Well, you can grieve him by living in bitterness, living in wrath living in anger, clamoring, being slanderous, being full of malice, all of those things. Uh, I don't think that grieving here is a judgment, and I don't think that God is necessarily frowning on you. If you uh, have a reference Bible, it might reference Isaiah 63, 9 to 11, uh, which is an interesting passage, and I'll read it for you. It says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them? Now, I know that today I am not grieving God to the point of being an enemy. Because Romans 5 says, I was an enemy, but I'm not any longer an enemy. Because of the cross, and because of his forgiveness, and because of his grace. And that is long-lasting. It's forever lasting. However, I think Paul's using it as an example so that we might think about when I'm walking every day and I'm supposed to be self-sacrificial uh, and I'm supposed to let this grace and love that is pouring into me pour out to others, which is a self-sacrificial grace because that's what was a result of. All of that, if I'm not doing that, then I'm not fulfilling my purpose. Um, and if there was anything that would grieve God and make him disappointed, that would probably be it. Because we read that's exactly what happened with uh, Israel, according to Isaiah. The other interesting thing about that passage from Isaiah, hopefully you wrote it down, 63.9, it says that in all their affliction he was afflicted. Isaiah believed that everything they experienced, God 
experienced. When they were afflicted, he was afflicted. When they were hungry, he was hungry. When they felt oppressed, he felt oppressed. And so he chose to move and to do something about it and to get them out of the situation that they were in. That is who God is. It's God, it's God today, just the same as God was for Isaiah. God, uh, according to Paul, his spirit is in us. And his spirit being in us means that we have something special. And that special is his grace. And that's what we need to realize so that we can get it out and not let moments go by. Um, like Paul said in verse 29 of, of Ephesians chapter 4, edification according to the need of the moment. You take that for God's grace according to the need of the moment. The need of the moment you're in, the relationships that you're experiencing. We experience relationships because we are made in his image. And God's image is a, a creator that is capable of having relationships. And that's what he wants. And so that's the same that we are. And he wants us to experience relationships just the way that he wants to experience relationships. Um, and if you're ever worried about, if you read this sometime and you're ever worried, I might have done something and greatly grieved God, and now I'm worried. First Timothy, I wrote this down, First Timothy 1.11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And the reason that I remembered that verse, I had to look up and see which verse it was, was because the very book my dad is asking me to look for her by Clive Pilkington talks about the happy God. And I remember the first time I heard him say it, I listened to some of his podcasts, the happy God. I'm like, what is that? Where does it say the happy God? Well, it only says it in the concordant translation, but the blessed God, what happens when you're blessed? You're happy. God is a happy God, because he's accomplished something. His son accomplished something. And he knows that in each of us, what he's accomplished is working its way to something. It's, it's, it's happening in us, whether we want it to happen or not. I don't think it means that if you're walking out to the way of the world or you're, as Paul says, the moments have gone by and you've used them, uh, where he says you've used them in bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, or slander, or malice, it doesn't mean that God's unhappy with you. It just means that the next time, the next time you're not going to block the grace. You're going to use it. You're going to use that vase, and you're going to let it work and do something. So when I think of gifts then, I think of just God's grace every day in us and what that means. If you go back to Romans chapter 12, And verses 6 to 8 says again, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We do all these things. We live with however we are, right? Some of us, you know, some people say uh, some people are extroverts or some people are introverts. That's you. So there's a way to use who you are for God among others. And it's going to be different in every moment that you live. And the way that one of us displays the grace of God is going to be different than another displays the grace of God. 
whether it's a gift or not. It is who you are, and you're supposed to use that grace and live. And so to me, it's just to be, it's just being present in who you are in that moment, no matter what the moment is, and just always strive to live that way and to be that way. You know, this morning I was thinking about uh, mostly I listen to worship music. And recently I had a reason not to listen to worship music all the time because I went somewhere with my brothers and saw a concert of someone I, a band I love. And I enjoyed myself, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I was just thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? I went to the concert, and because I've been listening to worship music and really not a lot else, even the album that that concert was for, I've only listened to a handful of times. Now since the concert, I've been listening to them constantly. And so what happens in my mind? I'm at work, and all day long I'm singing, singing their songs. That's what's in my mind. That's just how I am. Not everybody's like that. And I just thought, wow, something that keeps me centered and focused, I've set aside for a little bit, and now I've become unfocused, not as a person in general in life, but as a relation uh, to God. That's just what, that's what keeps me centered and focused. It might not be what keeps everybody else centered and focused. It's just... It's, it's just, it just gave me something to think about, and I think it goes along with this. What are you present in? What are you focused on? Are you focused on the world, or are you focused on God? And God's grace requires us to have that focus and that intent every day when we get up and we pray, and we say something simple like, Lord, work in me today and help me out because you know I'm going to forget. And just something, that reminder, to keep us going, um, whatever it might be for ourselves. Uh, you know, Paul talks about faith. I think we talked about uh, faith a little bit last week, as Paul talks about it as being, do you have more faith than another? Um, we don't. We have the faith of Christ in us. You might have a different idea about what I'm going to do today when I get up, am I going to live in faith? And that, of course, is faith that you have in God, but it falls back on the faith of Christ. That's the reason you can have that faith. Hebrews 11, 1, we, know it all, we all know it, says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I think that the idea we're looking at here of grace the experiential grace is so that it can be something that's seen. I have faith in something that's not seen. I don't see God. He's not right here, He's not standing in front of me. I have faith that God is in me because that's what the Apostle Paul said, and that's what God wanted to get the idea in my head that He's with me all the time. But how can I see that faith? I see it in other people. And that's what this grace is. It's something that brings out all these different components of what we consider to be our salvation. Um, having faith, stepping out in faith. Um, let's go over to Romans chapter 1. So I'm not going to read through the entire passage, but if you at, at some point read through Romans chapter 1, verses 5 to 18, I just want to bring out a couple verses. So uh, we're going to start with verse 5. He says, Through whom, being Jesus Christ our Lord, in verse 4, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. So Paul knows what he's called for. 
And he says that in verse 1. And it's all according to Jesus Christ our Lord, as he goes on to say in verse 1 through 4. And he says right in verse 5 that he's received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. So faith is something that's connected with obedience. And it's connected with, for Paul, apostleship, for everyone, I believe, grace. We've received the grace. Now we use faith to exercise that grace. And that is what we are called to do. That's why Paul says obedience. He's doing it out of obedience because he met someone and they told him, Paul, go do this. And that was Jesus. Go do this. And so he's doing it. And we might say, well, I've never been called to do something. I've never been called to do that. So people go to church every week and think the preacher has been called to preach. And so they just sit out and listen, and then they go off to their lives every day and hopefully retain a little bit of something and then go back and do it again. But we are all called, all of us, to exercise grace through obedience in faith. If you go down to verse 8, he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. So, apparently, the people in Rome were living in, certain, in such a way that their faith is being proclaimed all over the place. So they're being obedient. They've accepted God's grace, and they're living in it, and they're letting it flow through them to other people to a point where others can see it. And Paul calls that not their obedience, but their faith. Because they're being obedient in it, just like he was. But when he says, because your faith, it's the same as what he's saying about himself in verse 5, because they are doing something because of what he said to them, and that's the obedience. Because he says, he's calling out all the Gentiles, for Jesus' name's sake, that they would obedient, be obedient according to faith. Down in verse 12, it says that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So here we have something where he's trying to get across something. You can, you can go home and read it later. But what he's trying to say is there's encouragement in what I'm doing, and there's encouragement in what I see in you to help me keep doing what I'm doing and to help you keep doing what you're doing because we see each other's faith. We see each other's obedience. Then a couple verses later, he says, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. Then I would say, we are also under obligation. You know, sometimes we'll say, I'm not obligated to them for anything. If someone makes you mad. But guess what? According to God, you are obligated to them for something. You're obligated to them to live out the grace through obedience and faith and let it come out of you to them. That's what you are obligated to do. Paul says to the Greeks and the barbarians, I think the barbarians is great. <laughs> Obviously, they called them barbarians because they were different than they were, but speaking of the people mostly in, in Northern Europe, who seem crazy to people like Paul. But, he said, I am still obligated to them, the same as I'm obligated to anybody else. In verse 17 it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith, this is speaking of the gospel. He says in the verse previous, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, righteousness of God, 
is revealed from faith to faith. What is faith to faith? How about faith from me to faith from you? From you to you, to you, to you, to you, to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. Faith to faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. You live by faith. Faith in what he's done, and that faith is obedience according to what God has given us, which is grace. In a few different commentaries, it says faith should bring obedience to the new way of life we are called to. Faith, the faith, is seen seen is our obedience and the hope that it could be proclaimed because it could be seen. This was the idea, I I forget to forgot to write the commentary down, but it was the idea that they had that our obedience in the hope of Christ is displayed by our faith, and it's seen as we go out and live in the world by others. It's said that the hope is that God will be proclaimed, not just necessarily through words, but through how we live. That's what he's looking for. So we are to be encouraged when we see things like this happening from others. And I referenced... uh, Hebrews 11, and my dad did something on Hebrews 11 in the cloud of witnesses recently. We could be part of a cloud. Think about that, right? Because you would be someone who's doing something in faith, in what God wants us to do. And so someday somebody might remember and point to, I remember that group of people, I remember that person guess what? You have just become a cloud of witness to them. It may be a bunch of other people. That's what God's looking for uh, from us. And it is his purpose, and it is our obligation as believers to live in his grace. I wanted to have an example um, to go with this, because it seems, as I was doing this, it, it it seems like a lot and maybe a little abstract to describe. Uh, so I found a story of a, of a pastor who, was, who used to live in Mosul, Iraq, and his name was Pastor Kubria. And in case you didn't know, in Iraq, before the Gulf Wars, um, Christianity was accepted. Uh, think, of, think about the history that you read in here. Where did Paul travel? Where did Jesus travel? Where did the apostles travel? Where did all that happen? It happened right there. When Christianity started spreading to the world, it started, uh, we could say it started from Israel, uh, and it just spread itself out. And one of the most immediate places is what we would call today to be a rock. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, it's not the case anymore. Um, I read that one of the last places in the Middle East where Christianity is accepted, besides Israel, and it's not really all that kindly accepted in Israel either, is Lebanon. But even that is starting to uh, to dissipate. Syria also is widely accepted, um, which makes absolute sense. But anyways, this pastor had to leave because of ISIS. Um, they would paint, and I, I'm sure you remember several years ago, there was a big thing about the N being painted on houses, and people were selling t-shirts with N or I am N on it, uh, which in the Arabic letter meant none um, to indicate that this this property was to be confiscated because they were Christians. Um, He says him and his brother lost everything to ISIS. But his greatest concern, he says, is not for himself. It was for the people of ISIS because he thought they were victims. He said he continues to lead his church and helps minister to the thousands of refugees. So he left Iraq, but he didn't go far. He only went as far as where all the refugees were fleeing, um, because many of them were Christians um, that were fleeing also. Their homes that they lived in there for who knows how long, uh, antiquity. These people all had to live 
And you might say, because this, this is what he said. He said, the current crisis is a lot of pressure. God is giving us grace. We are doing what we can. And you might ask in a situation that he is in, what grace, right? You mention grace every day. We think of grace every day. I get up, I'm alive. I got a job, I have a house, I have this, I have things. This man had everything taken away. Everything. Um, people over there lost family members. They were killed, jailed, tortured, whatever. But he still says God is giving us grace. And we're doing what we can. And what is he doing? He's helping people. That's to him God's grace. I'm here. I got out. I'm alive. I'm going to where my countrymen have gone and need help, and that's where I'm staying, and I'm giving him help. And to him, that is God's grace. And then he says, we're doing what we can, and that's exactly what we're supposed to do. That's just some of what we read in the verses that Paul had for us. Activate it. Do something with it. You've got grace. God is in you. God wants to be seen. He wants to be heard. And he wants you to live in a way um, that is helping others. Amen.